Let's go ahead. Um, we're teaching on the foundations of faith. And um, praise the Lord, we've covered a lot. So we're just going to pick up tonight. Um, what does it mean to believe with the heart? What does it mean to believe with the heart? Let's run over to Romans chapter 10. That's Romans chapter 10. We make these statements a lot of times and we assume that people understand the terminology we're using uh, because we've heard them so much or we're, we're, so we're well versed in them. Uh, whatever the reasons are, oftentimes we leave other people behind who don't know what we're talking about and they're kind of, you know, going, what do you mean? And uh, we don't, we don't want to do that. And so if, you know, if there's any among us that don't know that or uh, if anyone's listening on the internet or by video cast or whatever, they don't understand the terminology. We want you to be versed in that terminology so you understand what we're saying when we say certain things. Um, I know sometimes things we say are a matter of semantics, but um, if we don't if we're on the same page semantic-wise, yeah. we, you know, we may be saying one thing and you're thinking another just simply because we don't understand or don't, we haven't defined the terminology we're using uh, for one another. And, uh, and you, you, sometimes you can use one terminology and another terminology, and they're saying the exact same thing. A lot of times where people talk about Bible subjects because you're using different terminologies, they think they're saying something different. When they're not, they're saying the same thing. So we want to make sure that we're on the same page. So what does it mean to believe with the heart? And um, we'll read from Romans chapter 10, and we'll start, um, we'll just start here in, in verse 8. It says, but what saith it? Well, let's back up and just get this whole thing in context. Verse 1, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they, that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now listen, oh, that's, that's, that's a big statement there. Because yeah. we can use that today. There's a lot of people with a lot of zeal, but they don't have any knowledge. And yet people will say, well, that's all that matters. They got the zeal, they got the love of God, they got God in the heart, they have zeal. Yeah, but see, Paul writes this because they don't have knowledge. You know, uh, he says this, they being ignorant of God's righteousness, go about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. In other words, the lack of knowledge is detrimental to your growth. You might have a love and zeal for God and not have the right knowledge that will get you messed up. Oh, God just looks at the heart. Well, Paul didn't say that. Paul said they had a zeal, but they didn't have it according to the knowledge of God. So it's important, uh, once again, we re reiterate that the word, the knowledge of the written scriptures, Amen. for the pinheads out there who don't believe we need the Bible anymore, and I did say pinheads. They're, they're, they're being motivated by the devil. I don't care what anybody, they're being motivated by the devil to say those things. Because it brings confusion and brings bondage and brings captivity to the mind of the unlearned when, when stupid statements are made like that. All right. But the righteousness, oh, let's say verse 5, uh, verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses described the righteousnesses of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Now some people say that Paul only preached the gospel of grace. Well, Paul also said he preached the word of faith. Yes, he did preach the gospel of grace, but he also preached the word of faith. He preached both. It's not one, it's not either or. It's both parts work together to make the whole. Amen. It's not that one is, one is, is uh, you, can, you exclude one or preach one at the exclusion of the other. You preach them both. It's real simple. The parts, the parts end up together making the whole, but the part is not the whole. Those who go around saying grace is all you need are trying to take the part and make it the whole. Then you have people preaching faith trying to make the part the whole. No, it's all working together. And all of them together make the whole. Amen? And we went in today to a, uh, Janie and I went on a, a cake date. Went up to North Greensboro to Maxie B's. Went in, they had cakes in there. And they cut me a piece of the, piece of the cake. That wasn't the whole cake. Yeah. Now it was good. Oh my goodness, it was good. It was chocolate with cream trees frosting. 
I mean, I mean, I just, my tongue fell out and hit the table three times. I look like Jaja Binks. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You got to see Star Wars to understand. Hallelujah. All right. But he said, what is it? The word of faith which we preach. So remember again, the, the part doesn't make the whole, but it is part. It, it, every part is important. Amen. Every part of the scriptures is important. Glory. Uh, the, the, the word of faith which we preach. Hallelujah. That, and here is the word of faith. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Now some translations or some uh, margins like to say this, that Jesus is Lord. And shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Praise God. And we could, I mean, we just go and read forever here. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him should not be ashamed. And we can just remember, we're not going to go further, because what I'm really going after here is, notice here in verses 9 and 10 that with your mouth you confess, but with your heart you believe. Not your head, your heart. Now, in doing a, a, um, an exegetical study of the Word of God, and that means a comprehensive study. It's not really, it's just a big theological term, comprehensive, you know, study uh, of the Word of God. You'll find the word heart and soul, particularly in the Old Covenant, used sometimes interchangeably. Yet when we come to the New Covenant, heart and soul stop being used interchangeably, and there is distinction made. Now, you, you can probably find some places in the Old Covenant where they're used separately, but, but particularly, and a lot of times in the Old, they did, they did uh, uh, mix them and, uh, or use them interchangeably. That's why you didn't think with scriptures like, he that wins souls is wise. And we, call it, we talk about soul winning. And those are all, you know, under a, a New Testament or an Old Testament mindset of understanding that's very accurate. Under a New Testament, we would probably say we're spirit winning. He that winning spirits is wise. Amen. Because there, there is a, a greater distinction drawn in the New Covenant between the two. Now, you know, years ago, people would, would, you'd ask them what was the difference. They wouldn't know there's a difference. That's how I thought they're the same thing. I thought the soul and the spirit were the same thing. And, and they're not. Else, when we get over to uh, the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews, and it says the Bible could separate them, how can they be the same if they can be separated? You can't. All right? So, um, with the heart, man believes. Now, let's look over at Mark eleven twenty three. 23. And Mark says here, Mark chapter 11, we know the story. You know that Jesus came by the fig tree. He was hungry. He said, came to the fig tree because it had leaves on it. And happily, he might find figs there on. There was none. So he said, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And the disciples heard it, went into town, came back out. Later on, they came back by and they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter called and remembered, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree was thou cursed, withered away. And Jesus answered, saith unto them, have faith in God, or have the God kind of faith of the faith of God. And then verse 23. All right. He says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say, here, now that sounds like um, Romans chapter 10, doesn't it? If you'll confess. Well, when you're confessing something, what are you doing? You're speaking, you're saying. You can't confess without talking. In, in, in police terms, if it's not spoken, they, de they uh, define it as a written confession. Okay? They stipulate it. Otherwise, confession, you're talking. But whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So here we have a couple things. We have confession, and we have believing with the heart. Well, didn't Paul say over in Romans chapter 10 that if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart? Well, he can't be talking about the organ of the cardiopulmonary uh, system. All right, the cardiovascular system, the, the the organ that pumps blood to and from you know to your throughout your body, and recycles it back and then pumps it up in the lungs and it goes through your body by the pumping action of the heart. He can't be talking about a physical organ. You can't believe with your heart. You can't believe with the physical organ. 
No, it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's the word heart used in figurative terms in reference to something else. The heart of a tree. Well, the heart, the trees don't have organs that pump blood. Right. You go study your, 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 um, your uh, biology and, and, uh, and, and whatever they call the, the, the earth sciences, studying trees and how things grow and all that kind of stuff. Um, you don't, you, uh, uh, trees have those little, those little systems of, of tubes in them that, that suck water up, but this drawn because of the uh, photosynthesis of the leaves causes it to draw the moisture up through the whole system. There's no heart pumping it. But they'll refer to the heart of the tree. We're talking about the core. It really, when we use that term, often, and we talk about the heart of the matter, we use it figuratively all the time in, in common language, talking about the heart, of, gotta get to the heart of the matter. Well, the matter doesn't have a pumping organ. Right. Get to the heart of the city. There's not a pumping organ down there. We're talking, we're talking about the center, the core of something. The central part of something. And see, the, so when we refer to conf believing with the heart, we're talking about the central part or core of man. And what is that? Well, uh, let's look at Romans chapter 2. Those other scriptures. Now we could listen, we could evolve to teach faith for a week on the other uh, on those scriptures. We're not here to teach that side. We're trying to teach something else. Look at Romans chapter two, verse. Um, uh, we better get over here into verse verse twenty four. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For the circumcision verily profiteth if you keep the law, but it be, if it be broken of the law, if, it, if you be a breaker of the law, that circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore circumcision keepeth, keep the righteousness of God, the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. Anybody confused yet? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inward. Inward. Lee. And circumcision is that of the, here we go again, heart. What do we, listen, I don't want anybody, if I get saved, going and cutting my chest up and going around and, and trying to cut the, uh, the, 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 there is a sack around the heart. The heart sack out to circumcise my fleshly heart. Why? I'll die. You die. Are you here? Circumcision of the heart in the spirit, Paul gives a hint here, and not of the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. John 3, chapter 3. So notice he says here that the circumcision is of the heart. Of the what? The heart. John 3, verse 3. We'll just read verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, saying came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Uh, Jesus recognized the wind being blown up the uh, robe. People like to blow wind up your skirt. They just like to pump, you know, they, they always want to say some, one thing, but they try, to, they try to butter you up on the front side, you know, get you off guard. Jesus did, and I'll tell you, I love it when people don't fall for that. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, that wind blowing didn't work. Okay, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And all the mothers of the earth said, Dear God, I hope not. <laughs> Amen? That was bad enough getting them out the first time. Getting them out full grown would not be fun. All right. That's a joke, guys. Come on. Jesus answered said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you that a man must be, or that you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. So, we, we have here uh, Romans 2 saying we're, we're he that's a, is a, Jew, is a Jew is one that's born what? Not inwardly, but outwardly. Let's, use, let's, look, let's look back over there in Romans real quick. Let's take a look at that. Kind of hold your place here in, in John. It says here, he is not a Jew, which is went outwardly. Well, how did he get become a Jew outwardly? He was born that way, right? 
but one which is inward in the flesh. What are you? You're born. Amen? In the flesh. Hallelujah. But he being a Jew, one inwardly is a circumcision of the heart. And see, remember under the old covenant, they had the circumcision of the flesh to come into the king, to promissory note of the kingdom. Under the new covenant, they have a circumcision of the heart. Of the spirit. In the letter of the spirit. In the spirit. In the spirit. Jesus said, except the man is born again, thus he's born of the spirit. Amen. So now we're beginning to tie these terms together. That we're, we're circumcised in the Spirit. Here he says you're born of the Spirit over in John 3. Now look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now this is, this is in a litany of, of encouraging things that Paul um, said to do. Verse 23, he says, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Not, not holy like pure or separated, but holy, complete. The whole, the completion. Holy, and I pray God, your whole spirit, and that word in the Greek is pneuma, and soul, which in the Greek is suke, and body. Now, I, I, I always forget. I need to go look up body and put that. Because I don't think it's carne. Huh? Soma. Soma. Hey, thank you. Thank you. And that's P.S. Isn't it also, isn't it? Is that also P.S.? Yeah. Uh, transliterated. Yes. So, yeah. Soma. S-O-M-A. Okay. So, body is soma. Uh, be, be preserved blameless. Notice he said your whole pneuma, suke, and soma be preserved blameless. And he said, God pray God sanctify you wholly, the whole of man. So, Paul now makes it very clear that spirit and soul are not the same thing. If they were, if they were, he'd just say, I pray God your whole spirit or soul. He could interchange the terms. And body be preserved blame, but he, he, he changed it. And listen, there's a group of people out there, whole whole denomination, whole movement that'll get fighting mad and call you a cult if you believe that man is spirit, soul, and body. Because they only believe that man is soul and body. And there's a whole movement. They used to stand outside of Hagen meetings and Copa meetings with signs, you know, t telling them not telling people not to go in there because they were a cult because they believed in the spirit, soul, and body. Bless their darling hearts and stupid heads. If they're not, if they're, if they're the same thing, then why, why do Paul use different terms? Huh? They'd have thrown, him out. They'd have thrown Paul out of the church. <laughs> well, some folks tried. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. But notice he said, I pray you the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly, the whole, your whole spirit and your soul, your whole pneuma, your whole suke, and your whole soma, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So man is a tripart being. To man is a tripart being. He is spirit, possesses a soul, lives in a body. Now, um, Brother Hagin said, and I'm not sure if he got it from somebody else, but he used to say, with my spirit I contact the spiritual realm, with my soul I contact the intellectual realm, with my body I contact the physical realm. But if we'll go look at the Bible, uh, remember, the, remember the parable? And really the parable is really a story. We, we call it a parable. It's not a parable. It's the, remember the story of Lazarus. How that Lazarus died and was taken to Abraham's bosom and the rich man died and was taken into, into hell and into torments. Now, their bodies died. They were separated from the bodies. So that means, that, that, understand this, that means that the spirit and soul, and, and, um, and we'll talk about this, a little, we'll get to this. We're trying to, I'm probably running ahead. I am running ahead. Look over in Luke 16. Hallelujah. That's probably the... I'm jumping ahead in my notes here. Verse uh, 19. There was a certain rich man. Now, that's why we say it's not a parable. He said there was a certain rich man. Amen. If it was a parable, he always said. Now, uh, he, would t he, would, he would say stories, but they wouldn't say certain. There's a certain rich man. Okay, which had clothed in, fine, in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain Lazar beggar named Lazarus, 
which was laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked the sores. Now, you understand that uh, they like proven that dog saliva has a healing property to it. It's kind of gross. But it's about as gross as putting maggots in, in open wounds and eating the infection out to keep people alive. The people they they do that in places. When you're when you're in places you can't get the medicine, they'll put uh, they'll put maggots in there, and the maggots will just keep eating the infection out and keep it from going to gangrene and stuff. Now people say, oh, that's gross. I'd rather have the I'd rather have the maggots and get the arm keep the arm later than have it go to gangrene because that goes grossed out by the maggots. Right. Amen. We we can we can get rid of the maggots later and get the arm sewed up. <laughs> Amen. Are y'all grossed yet? Aren't y'all glad we didn't eat supper right tonight? Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but the more of the dogs came and licked the swords, and it came to pass that the beggar died. It was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. What, what, what that? Well, listen, he was buried. What was buried? Well, the next verse says, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. His body wasn't in hell. His body was buried. Same thing happened to Lazarus. The body was buried. Um, just a real quick side note. You need, to, you need to write this down in your Bible. If you don't, if you, you probably have heard us say this before. We, we need to keep reiterating because people are always learning. People are, you know, it's amazing to say stuff sometimes and somebody will come to you 10 years after you said it and been saying it for 10 years ago. I finally got it. I think, well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you finally got it. Amen. Um, that the word death in the Bible never means the cessation of existence. See, for a man to die physically, he doesn't cease to exist. He's separate. The word really, uh, and you can't, you can't get a concordance to tell you that it means separation. But when you study things in context, you see that's what takes place. What did Paul say? To be, present from the, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. A how can you be absent from the body? You die. Well, we use the term die. But see, we are so carnally trained and driven in our thinking that we believe that when someone dies, they cease to exist. And we, we'll say, well, yeah, but many people say, yeah, they went to heaven. But and, and really, if you kind of get down into the deepest of their soul, they, they, they kind of view it as they've ceased to exist. Biblically, cessa or, or the death that does not refer to the cessation of existence, but rather the separation. Physical death is the separation of the human spirit from the human body. You still exist, and the real man is you. Paul says in one place, he says, I buffet my body daily. I buffet my body. Now, we don't talk about our body. I buffet. No, we would say, I buffet me. No, he buffets his body. He referred to his body almost like an alien entity or a separate entity. Why? Because he can be separated from it. Amen. And so he buffeted his body or kept his body under. When you die, the spirit of man is separated from the physical body. Where you go is based on what you, what you believed. Did you confess Jesus as Lord and receive him as your Lord? Or did you reject that and rebel against that? Uh, if you believed and received him as Lord, you go to heaven. Paul said that to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. He wasn't talking to sinners. For sinners to be absent from bodies, to be present with the devil. In hell. And that's what happened to the rich man here. So, uh, spiritual death is the separation of the human spirit from the father of spirits, that is God. That's spiritual death. Eternal death is the eternal separation of the human spirit from God's presence, from the spirit of God. Never to be, con never to be reconciled again. So those are the three terms we use for death in the Bible, eternal death, spiritual death, and physical death, none of them referring to cessation of existence, but all of them referring to separation from something. Okay? So when the rich man died, his spirit was separated from his body. And his body was, he was buried, but his body was buried. His, he in hell lifted up his eyes. His spirit went to hell. In torments and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and otherwise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Besides all this, between us, there, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither they can pass to us that would come from thence. 
Then he said, I pray therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said, they have Moses and the, oh, I love this. They have the scriptures. They have Moses and the prophets. That's, that was the reference to the scriptures. Yeah. Let them hear them. Oh, man. And he said, Nay, Father, but if one went from the dead, they will not repent. They will repent. He said, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, if they will not hear the scriptures, they, neither will they repent, be persuaded, though one, be rose, though one rose from the dead. And you got people out there saying, Now, we don't need the written scriptures anymore. I wonder why. Because there's power in the written word. Amen. We can. We got rid of the stuffy. Hallelujah. But notice here, some, something very interesting. That while I'm talking here, run on over to Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, just, just slip on over to Hebrews chapter 4. Notice that the rich man knew who Lazarus was. Hello? Notice he had, he had emotional concern. He wanted someone to go warn his brothers. Amen? See, the soul, the suke, is the seat of the, of the emotion of man. The will of man is, is set in the, in, the, in the soul. The soul and the spirit remain intact together. They stay together. Although they are separate, they remain intact together. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, um, verse I can read this whole chapter. This is a good, good thing to read. But um, uh, verse 12, for the Word of God. And if you're reading from an old King James Version, uh, it's quick. Then the word quick was used in Elizabethan English to refer to alive. When you're quickened, you're made alive. You know, so the word in, in Elizabethan English or the Queen's or the King's English, depending on who's sitting on the throne. <laughs> if, it's, if, the, if it's right now, it's the Queen's English. Hallelujah. Uh, for the Word of God is alive. One translation says, a living thing. I believe it's probably Weymouth or, or, or Weiss, probably one of those that say, uh, the Word's a living thing. Hallelujah. And powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Even through the dividing asunder of what? Suke and Numa. Even to the dividing asunder of Suke and Numa. Spirit, soul, and spirit. How can you separate them if they're the same? You can't. Now, they may remain intact together in existence. But they're not the same thing. See, when you're born again, remember when we get born again? So look over, uh, hold your place right here. Um, let me finish reading the scripture. Um, quick and powerful, living and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and as the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, right over, hold your place here, or just save it because we may come back here. And. Um, Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll pick up verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, one of the other translations uh, writes it this way. It says a new species of being that never existed before. Uh, others say new creation. Um, Jesus said, well, let's a man be born again. Amen. So old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God. How many forgot who you were and where you lived when you got saved? If the old things that have become new, and the old things that passed away uh, and became new were your soul, we'd have to get your driver's license and uh, some of those things um, before you died. Before you got saved, I'm sorry. You, we have to get those before you got saved. Are y'all here? You gone home? In order, so it can't be. It cannot be in reference to the soul. That all things became new. And if we want to hold, stick your finger here and run real quick over to Romans chapter 12. Look 
at verses 1 and 2 of Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, or the Greek says spiritual service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What sits in your soul? Your mind. Do you remember what the, um, in the Old Covenant, under the 23rd Psalm, what happened to the soul? He restoreth my soul. Yeah. Under the New Covenant, your spirit gets born again. Paul says here, renewing the mind, that's restoring the soul. We have different processes. Let me, let me say this, because man is a three-part being, there are three different processes uh, of which the believer is responsible for, for the three different areas. The new, the, 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 the new man, the born-again man, is born again, and then he, 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 he feeds, what? On the milk of the Word, so he can grow thereby. And then he continues to feed on the Word, and comes to full age and begins to eat meat. The Word of God also is there to restore the soul, to change. Paul says here in Romans 12, be not conformed. That word conformed in the Greek means to be fashioned or shaped or molded according to the world, but be transformed, Greek word metamorpho, where we get our English word metamorphosis. Let your soul go through a metamorphosis, your mind go through a metamorphosis, what? The by the renewing of your mind. How? By the Word of God. The Word of God that you may prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. The, we're told to offer our bodies a living sacrifice and to buffet them. So we, can, we control. You don't get a new body. You keep your body controlled. That's why there's so many scriptures about that in the Bible. People come along and say, I just look at the finished work of Jesus. Well, that's not what the Bible said to do. The Bible said keep your flesh under. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, <clears throat> I'm looking at, uh, and this, this, this is the statement the finished work of Jesus is really a, a mispresentation of something. The work that Jesus completed at the cross was the requirements of the old covenant to be reconciled to God and creating the new, um, the new and the better way. Okay? The new and the better way. That is done through Jesus Christ. That's done through the grace of God. We can't earn it. We can't do it. We, we could never, ever, 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 ever do everything the Bible required under the Old Covenant to become righteous. Jesus fulfilled all that. And by grace made a way whereby when we receive Him as Lord, that the, all the requirements and all the judgments against us are, 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 are abolished. But yet, we got a body to deal with. And you're told to do something about that body. And your mind is still messed up. Are you here? Your thinking needs to be changed. Because when you first get saved, though your Second Corinthians says all things are new, how many know that you still think the same way? He can't be talking about the suke. He's making reference to the pneuma of man, just like Jesus did when he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Can I enter the second time? No. You know that you're born of the flesh, and he said, well, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Your spirit is born again. Hallelujah. And it becomes new. What do you mean? It passes from death unto life. It passes out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. A new nature is imparted into you. you. The nature now is the nature of God. You no longer are the nature of sin. You're no longer dead to God. You've been spiritually reconciled to God. You still got to do something with that stinking thinking. Now, E.W. Kenyon used to make a statement that was very interesting. He said the, the, the believer that does not renew their mind to the Word of God will imitate a sinner. And this is really what Paul's saying here in Romans chapter 12. He says that uh, be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What? Don't, be conf don't act like the world. Be conformed, fashion, molded, shape. Don't act like the world. But have a metamorphosis. Change, have a way of thinking and a, and a thought process that is different or com totally different than the way it was. And the Word of God re what the, restores, renews the mind, the soul, so that you now think like the Bible. You think like a believer. You think like a child of God.
If you don't do that, you'll be an immature Christian who imitates sinners. And you'll live in defeat. And you'll live below the privileges of, of being in Christ. You just don't sit back like some vegetable dodo brain and look up and go, I'm looking at the finished work of Jesus and not do anything. You have a responsibility to feed on the Word of God, the written Scriptures. Wherefore are given unto us, Peter says, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Amen? Desi As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that ye may grow thereby. The word of the written word of God's vital. Amen? Okay. But they see, I'm trying to show you there's some, there's different things. And it may seem like as a baby Christian, that's a lot to get your get your arms around. That's why we have to keep the babes covered and protected and help them grow. But as we mature, it, it becomes easier to get your to, to get your arms around the whole thing. The more you grow, the easier it is. Okay? I mean, you ain't going to have no trouble with your flesh. Some of you probably have trouble with your flesh today. Some of you are probably sitting somewhere and the thought came, don't go to church tonight. Go home, get a bath, lay down. Take a nap. Clunk just died. I mean, Clunk rolled over. I tipped the cow right then. <clears throat> he was laying on his back and rolled over twice. All right. Clunk the sacred cow took a nosedive. Yeah, you had to put your body under. Some of you may have thoughts today you shouldn't have had when it hit somebody. <laughs> you weren't singing Don Francisco's I Gotta Tell Somebody. You were singing your own personal song, I Gotta Hit Somebody. <laughs> well, see, you've got to have your mind renewed to overcome that. Amen? So we, we, we understand that man is a spirit, he has a soul, lives in a body. See, we used to think that if you got saved, that's all you needed. Your spirit was alive, you were going to heaven, that's all you needed. Well, you can make heaven, but you can live a defeated life the whole, whole way there. Amen. God doesn't want you to live a defeated life. God wants you to live a victorious life. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, where was I when I got off on all that? That was good anyway, wasn't it? I said that was good anyway, wasn't it? Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, back over here in, in, in 1 Corinthians. So, he says there in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things pass away. All things become, behold, all things become new. All things are of God. Verse 18. I look down here in verse 21. For he hath made him sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You ever had your head do unrighteous thinking? <laughs> Yet the word says that when you got born again, you became the righteousness of God in him. Why? Because your, your suke has to be renewed, restored. When you, now listen, you get born again, you instantly are a child of God. But you're a babe. You're not full grown. Your spirit needs to grow. You need to be in church. You don't need some lunatic group of people getting together and not having a pastor. Yeah. Amen. You need a good local church. You can't make it without, you can't make it. Oh, I'm just as good sitting at home watching, the, oh, hogwash. You've listened to a lie of the devil. I said, you've listened to a lie of the devil. My, 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 my. All right. Um, Dr. Bill, where was I? Okay. Let's, look, let's flip, just go back over one chapter to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Because we were, we, were, we were in chapter 5, verse 17 through 21 there. Flip, just get back over one chapter. Look at first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll, we'll start in uh, verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, and the abundant grace might be, through the, uh, 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 that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For this, for which cause we faint not. But though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So now Paul's referring to two different, two different things. See? We've got, a, we've, got a, we've got an inner man, we've got an outer man. We have a spirit, we have a body. Amen? 
for our, I love this, for our light affliction is but for a moment. I'm going to tell you right now, you hear some pe people whine, and they whine about how tough it is, and how rough it's been, and how hard the road has been. I was listening to Dad talk the other day, and he's talking about people who say they live by faith. He said, you don't know nothing to live by faith. Driving your, driving your Cadillacs, living in your fancy houses, oh my God, if you went through what I went through, you wouldn't have made it. You don't know nothing about living by faith. Now, I, I think there's a lot of people who kind of got in and taught things and made money on it and go around telling everybody how, 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 how great it is to live by faith. They never faced a tough time in their life. People shoving money all down their pockets and in their coats and they call that the blessing of the Lord and they ain't never lived a tough day. Hello? They weren't right. I, I listened to that talk. I, I'm, gonna, I'm about to get out of here and ramble. I'm going to ramble real quick and come back. Riding down, he, he drove all night long to get from meeting to meeting. And you, you know what? He said, I didn't drive at night because I like driving at night. He said, my tires were so bald that if I drove during the day, daytime, the heat would heat them up and blow them. And he didn't have a spare. So he had to drive at night when it was cooler. And the tires just are singing to him. What you going to do now? 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 Drive home to see his wife for just one day so he could go to the next meeting and, and come in. And he's the, the, three, months behind, three months behind on their mortgage. See, we don't, we, don't, we don't hear that side of the story, do we? We hear the side that they were, you know, Raymond Bible Church sits on an acre of land. You, you don't hear the side that, you know, uh, Pastor Hagen at 12 years old went, on, went out on during the summer with him a few times and said, Daddy, why can't you be home like all the other daddies? Why have you got to be gone all the time? How he got in his car and drove off and left the, the, his wife and two children behind and cried all the way to the next meeting. Come back home. He had to come back home and, and three months behind and he had his last offering in his pocket and no meeting to go to. And he knew he wasn't enough to even pay anything. Put the names of people they owed money to in a hat and drew names to see, uh, spend the money until they ran out of the money. My God. We think we have it tough because, you know, you know, uh, we, we, we couldn't fill the car up this week. My brother and sister, we're going to have to learn to live out of our spirits and live by faith and something greater than, you know, you got a hangnail this week. Or somebody at work talked ugly about you. But come on now. We're talking about we're faith people. We're faith people. <laughs> Somebody just got woke up, didn't you? <laughs> see, see, the devil lied to you and tell you because you're having a hard time, you're not living by faith. It's the faith people who live through the hard times. I didn't say that you, we, we welcome hard times and we enjoy hard times. I'm saying that when they come, the faith people make it through them. Amen. It's easy. I said it's easy to preach prosperity when people are shoving money in your po coat pockets and shoving it in your pants and then you walk out with 25, a bag of $25,000 cash extra. Because people just run up throwing money on the platform because they're giving up. Come talk to me about faith when you've been down the road and your tires are bald, you wore out three pairs of shoes walking and you're taking, and then you have to sell a car for junk and you hitchhike to your meetings. Preaching faith. Come talk to me then. I don't want to hear what you got to say if all you've ever done is, is, is coattailed in on somebody else's teaching and got your Cadillac and got your Mercedes and got your fancy stuff and you ain't never been there. Wow. And hadn't lived it. Hadn't proved it out. And preached it. Preached it when it didn't look like it was working. Hello. Y'all yeah. hear you going home. See, when we learn to live from our spirits, learn to live out of the inward man, and we lay hold of the promises of God, know our God, we become fully persuaded in our spirits. We don't just do something because somebody it was, it was cool and we got it all hyped up about it because somebody walked in and they they uh, they have on Rolex watches and they got on diamond rings and you know all this kind of stuff and they're you know there, there was back time back in the eighties, late eighties that preachers just went around and preached. Pastors would preach for each other pastors and they would always give each other their Rolex because they were sewing for a more expensive Rolex. Ro Rolex was the thing back then. Now you got a full salary from your church and you go and preach in other churches and they're taking up offerings. 
Hello. You tell everybody I'm sold with my Rolex, and then somebody goes out and goes, oh, he sold his Rolex. He sold. God told me to give him another one, give him a presidential. I'm going to tell people they're believing for, for presidentials. Why don't you believe for something not tell anybody and see how it works? Receive it without having to tell anybody. It's too easy to manipulate people. I said, it's too easy to manipulate people. Well, you know, brother, I'm believing that uh, the, uh, the $20,000 I'm in debt right now, personally, this year will be paid off. I'm just believing. I got my faith out there. Church, I just want y'all to know it. And then all of a sudden, somebody, pastor's believing for 20, his debt. God spoke to me and told me to go put a mortgage in my house and go pay off his debt. That's just too much manipulation goes on. And it's okay to share what the church needs. The church needs this or whatever. That's, that's we're, involved, we're involved in the church. We need to do this. We need to do that. That's, that's, I'm talking about this stuff where people talk about they're, they're living by faith. Yeah. And they're living by manipulation of somebody else's message. That went over big. Praise the Lord. My, 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 my. I done, I done gone to meddling. Hallelujah. But I got anointing when I was meddling. I could sense the anointing. Praise the Lord. You can live out of your spirit. You can live by faith. But don't think just because you live by faith, life's going to be a fire bed of ease. That everything's going to be a hunk of dory. And Tiny Tim will be outside your window every night singing tiptoe through the tulips on his ukulele. <clears throat> I'm going to have Nathan come in one day with his ukulele and do it for you. He does it almost perfect. <laughs> Hallelujah. I let him hear it one time. He's, he's going around the house with his ukulele. Doing tiptoe through the tulips. Hallelujah. No, we're spirit beings. We live out of our spirits. Not out of the flesh. Not out of the soul, but out of the human spirit that's alive unto God. Reconciled to God through the new birth. Where the life of God abides and dwells. Become the temple of the Holy Ghost. Your body's not the temple. Your spirit's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <laughs> I said hallelujah. My, my. My. Mm. You sense that? That's the glory of God. Hallelujah. The human spirit's been made alive unto God. And we've not given enough attention to the spirit. We've given all the attention to our flesh. One of the things we did in the faith move, uh, or, or with the teaching revival, and a lot of people call it the faith movement or whatever, the name it, claim it, frame it, the blab it and grab it, you know, uh, all the different things they call it. But one of the things we did is we got off, we got everything got over onto the flesh. Cadillac. New house. Supernatural debt cancellation. Are those things wrong? No. But when they become the focus, we're majoring on the flesh and not on the spirit. Hello? Amen. Our eyes are consumed. We, we become consumed. Did you know that Jesus in the parable of the sower said the lust of, uh, the, the, the lust of other things entering in choketh the word and makes it unfruitful? The deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things enters in and it chokes the word and makes it unfruitful. We have to, we, that's why we've got to live out of our spirits. We have to be governed by our spirits. Come on now. Amen. Come give in this offer and you'll be debt free next week. I saw a thing on House Hunters last night, watching House Hunters. And they said, you know, you know, watch this particular show and text this to the to the thing <clears throat> and for to a chance to win fifty thousand dollars to pay off your mortgage. Now, now listen, that, that wasn't really true, was it? Because in most cases, fifty thousand dollars is not gonna pay off most people's mortgage. Unless they're way down on the tail end of their mortgage. $50,000 is just going to help reduce their mortgage. See, it was a misnomer. It was a misstatement. See, we get caught up, in, we get caught up sometimes and think, boy, if I, just have, if I have that new car or whatever, I'm going to demonstrate that I have faith in God. 
Learn to be at peace when the tires are singing, what you're going to do now. Learn, learn that when your wife asks you how did everything go, how are we going to pay the bills? Because they, they looked at the bills while you were gone. Learn to say everything's all right. Hallelujah. Amen. So they got a phone call the next morning. Came in that night, came in, knew, knew we didn't have it. Nowhere to preach. Nowhere to preach. Last offering in his pocket. Got in at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Next, next morning, she got up, got the kids off school, let him sleep. Phone rang about 9 o'clock in the morning. And he said, well, he, 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 you know, I, he got in really late. I think he said, he said, I'm awake. When they answered the phone. Uh, Brother Hagan, you don't know who I am. But uh, I've heard of your ministry. I want you, will you come hold a meeting for me? Yeah, I can start tomorrow night. He said, well, give me three or four days to do some advertising. <laughs> and he's, ready, he's getting ready to drive that driveway right there and go preach that meeting. See? Everything's all right. Learn, you learn to live out of your spirit. When everything looks bad, your soul has to be renewed, your body has to be kept under, and your spirit listens and communes with God. Hallelujah. I said your spirit listens and communes with God. And there's peace when there should be no peace. Hallelujah. There's comfort when there's no comfort. There's a knowing that everything's all right when everything is bad. Hallelujah. And out of the inner man, praise God, you can live in victory and overcome. Ha <laughs> ha. And live the way God designed you to live. Hallelujah. Spirit beings walking in the light and in communion with the Father of Spirits. <laughs> praise God. I said praise God. Amen. Amen.